my pleasure to introduce Dr. Abby Groskopf. Dr. Groskopf received her PhD in chemical engineering from Stanford University and has recently started a position at, as a scientist at Genentech. Today, she will be presenting research she conducted at Apple Labs at Stanford on the role of viscosity measurements in the design of injectable biomaterials. It is my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Groskopf. Hi, everyone. Just give me a minute. All right, I am sharing, trying to share. Um. You don't see my screen, do you? I do not. It seems like I might be here. Sorry, it's asking, it, I just had to close and reopen because it um, was not happy with recording my screen without me giving it consent. Um, and let's see, I don't see, let me a see way, a button to share my screen. It hasn't changed. Oh yeah, there we go. Now do you see? Yes. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Sorry for the, the little bit of delay of figuring out um, how to how to connect. Um, but thank you so much uh, for listening today. And I'm excited to share some of my research from Stanford University. I did my PhD in the Apple lab. Um, and we really study injectable biomaterials for drug delivery applications. Um, and sort of, off, your screen went black. All right, let's see. I can see it now. Yeah, I'm just gonna disconnect. How about now? I can still, see, I can see the screen now. It's not black, right? Nope. Great. Um, yeah, so sort of midway through my PhD, um, we were looking for ways to really understand injectability. Um, and we came across Rayosense. And so since then, um, we've really uh, found great use of the viscometers from Rayosense. And I'll show you some of that data today. Um, but I'll kind of give you the whole picture of what we work on and some of these hydrogel materials and the applications we're interested in. So hydrogels are commonly used as biomaterials because they're water swollen networks they're aqueous based just like our body um, and they have very unique mechanical properties highly mimetic of tissues so hydrogels have been used in everything from drug delivery to growing cells in 3d to wound dressings i was just at cvs last week and saw hydrogel wound dressing um, and then of course contact lenses that we use every single day Physical hydrogels um, are sort of an emerging field. Most people are more used to what you would think of as a covalent hydrogel. Um, and so I'm these so hydrogels- again. Your slides aren't moving now. 
we're just seeing that initial slide. Okay. Um, let's try. How is this? Is it moving? No, I'm just seeing the overall presentation window. Well, let's see. Your, your first slide and then all the slides to the left panel. Huh, when I play, it seems like it does not um, change, if that makes sense. Um, do you have do you have my slides? I do. Because I've tried sharing my entire screen and then I also tried sharing just the window. Um, it looks like the file you sent me won't open on my computer. Let's see. Downloaded, but it doesn't want to open. Is it possible to share not in like presentation mode, even though that's what we recommended? Sure. So I can see the keynote screen. Um, so are you seeing a change now? No. So I'm changing it now. It seems like it's just totally frozen. I can try quit quitting keynote. How about well now is it changing? No. No, mm -hmm. it's the same screen. If I someone said try the view icon in the upper left corner. Um of your keynote. It's just, it looks like it's frozen. Like it's still showing my screen the exact same way, right? It hasn't changed. Correct. Um, so why don't I just stop sharing and then start sharing again? Now I can see your desktop. So it's not frozen anymore. Now let's see. There you go. It's working. Nice. All right. Oh, I just had to quit and come back. Um, great. OK, well, starting again. Um, so hi, uh, I talked a little bit, but there's many different key applications. And we are particularly interested in physical hydrogels because traditionally, one thinks of covalent gels with these static bonds that do not come apart and once they form they are stuck there they are the way they are um, whereas on the right you can see we're very interested in these physical hydrogels that have dynamic bonds um, that can come apart and reform and this allows for materials to be for example injectable or self-heal after injection um, and you can tune the dynamics of these bonds for any application you're interested in um, 
And so there's been several uses of these different physical hydrogels and physical hydrogels can be formed through many different chemistries. So here's a few examples. Um, so here's a gel formed through hydrogen bonding um, here on the left, a gel formed through uh, hydrophobic interactions. So this was a, a hyaluronic acid methyl cellulose mixture. And then finally, um, gels are formed through ionic interactions. And you can see these different gels were all used for various applications, ranging from drug delivery to tissue engineering to bioprinting. In our lab at Stanford, um, I've really focused on a hydrogel platform that we call polymer nanoparticle hydrogels. And these gels are formed through two main components, an HPMC, C12 polymer, and PEG-PLA nanoparticles. The HPMC is hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose that we modify through an isocyanate reaction with, to have this dodecyl chain. It's basically a carbon chain. You can see this repetitive carbon chain. We then mix these with polyethylene glycol, polylactic acid nanoparticles um, that we polymerize ourselves through anionic ring opening polymerizations. Um, and then we basically take the copolymer, the PEG PLA, we drop it into water, as you can see in this video, and it naturally forms these core shell nanoparticles with the PLA in the center and this PEG corona around the outside. When we take these two materials and mix them together um, with a lot of water, um, what's fascinating is these C12 chains, these HPMC C12 polymers, lay down in a dynamic fashion on the nanoparticles and kind of have this dynamic interaction bridging between the nanoparticles to form a robust structure. Um, you can see we can easily make these in the lab um, in a sterile fashion for bioapplications where we have the polymer on the left, the nanoparticle solution, and say whatever drug or cells we want to encapsulate on the right. And then we can mix And after about 30 seconds to a minute, a homogeneous physical hydrogel will form. And you can see these gels, um, because of this dynamic interaction, can be easily um, pushed through needles for injection. However, um, after they're injected, they rapidly uh, self-heal to form this robust material. And you can see it's not flowing due to gravity. Um, it's a robust completely healed material after injection. And so these materials have formed the basis for many different projects in our lab, ranging from um, delivery of drugs and different proteins for immunoengineering applications like vaccines, um, the delivery of therapeutic cells, which I'll kind of highlight today as one of the applications. We've actually used these gels as adhesion barriers in surgery. Um, so a lot of the time, these fibrous adhesions form after someone has surgery in their abdomen. And so what we found is that you can coat the organs with a hydrogel, our PNP, polymer nanoparticle hydrogel, um, and it can serve as a protective barrier to prevent organs from sticking together. And finally, we have even used these gels um, to deliver fire retardants. Um, so not a bio application, actually, but more of an environmental application um, to prevent wildfire. These gels can stick to foliage and um, kind of help retain those fire retardants. So early on in my PhD, um, I really started to figure out how to make these gels reproducibly and how to characterize them the best way. And what we really started with is just basic rheology. And really, this rheology is much more relevant to post-injection. So once you've injected, we want a solid-like material. And you can see I can run a frequency sweep. Um, and you can see across this frequency, the G prime, the storage modulus is greater than that loss modulus. And so we have a fairly flat response to frequency. And so these are very solid-like across many frequencies. We also characterize the yield stress, um, meaning how much um, does this material have to resist before it will flow? And so we want a yield stress to form a depot um, once the material is injected so that it doesn't just 
dissipate into the body, but it stays this solid like material. And so I kind of dove into what's really driving gel formation and can we understand um, more about the optimal formulations to make a, a very robust physical hydrogel. Um, and so I did calculations looking at the spacing of the nanoparticles. You can see as we go to a very high weight percent, there's very little space between these nanoparticles. And as we increase the amount of polymer in the formulation, um, we can vary kind of how much polymer is coating each of these nanoparticles, if you think of it this way. And so I did a series of rheological studies, just looking at how the formulation changes as we add nanoparticles or as we add polymer. And you can see here, we have a constant polymer content of two weight percent. So PNP dash, this is the number amount of polymer, this is the amount of nanoparticles. So at a constant two weight percent of polymer, I increase the amount of nanoparticles and you really can observe gel formation. It's becoming more solid like we don't see a crossover in the storage and loss moduli and we see more frequency independent behavior. And similarly, I was able to keep a constant nanoparticle content. So here, one weight percent and vary the amount of polymer. And what was pretty interesting is actually when we have less polymer, we see a more solid like response. Even though it's softer, there's lower moduli, we actually see a bigger gap between the moduli, the tan delta is lower, and we see a more frequency independent response. And so we really saw the reverse of what we expected, but this really gave us an idea of design criteria um, in designing these gels more for post-injection, right? So we can see that we have the most solid like behavior when we're in this certain polymer to nanoparticle ratio. Um, we have a flatter slope when we're in this certain ratio, and we also have a higher yield stress. And so going forward, we thought we really wanted to be um, kind of in this mid regime where we have this synergy and these optimal properties. And so while we were able to use a traditional rheometer to measure the properties um, more relevant to post injection, the key to our hydrogel is that it's really injectable, right? And so we thought we really need to be understanding injectability um, and how these materials behave in shear flow. And so a postdoc in particular, um, Hector Lopez, um, you can see he's had a few papers in our lab, really focused his work um, on understanding this injectability, right? You have a human pushing the syringe, <coughs> um, and in a shear thinning fluid, it follows this, this power law of behavior. And so he used, um, pipe flow equations to back out basically some parameters that will be needed for injectability. And so you can see typical rheometers can only measure up to around 100 um, inverse second shear rates, but for bioprinting or for these drug delivery applications that require injection, we need to reach much higher shear rates. And he derived this equation where this K is that consistency index um, and the N is the flow index um, and the power law equation of the, the fluid. And he performed a series of experiments with our polymer nanoparticle gels and alginate gels here. And he changed the amount of nanoparticles, whereas in the alginate, he changed the amount of ion. And it was pretty cool, he, he saw that Basically, the polymer content, regardless of cross-linking, is what drives the behavior at these really high shear regimes. You can see what 2,0, so polymer content to nanoparticle content, looks very similar to 2,5, whereas one polymer zero nanoparticle looks very similar to 1,5. So it's really the polymer content that was driving injectability. Um, and what he did is he derived this equation, which kind of told us whether the force that you're pushing, this pressure, um, is enough to be able to easily flow uh, the, the hydrogel material through the particular needle or catheter. 
and really determine whether something's injectable or not. Um, and just a quick plug, um, you can see on our lab website, um, we have this extrudability tab where you can put in um, your power law parameters, the consistency index and that N, so the K and that N, um, that flow index, and it will tell you whether you're in this injectable regime or whether your consistency index, that kind of baseline viscosity is just too high and the material will not be injectable. So this tool was really key to our lab for designing highly injectable materials based off of human force, um, where we assume human force, you can see down here, is about 50 newtons. Um, and you can change in our calculator that diameter of the plunger to basically change the pressure. And so once we realized that these, this high shear rate data was really key to designing our materials, that's when um, we found out about Rayosense and we got an MV Rock viscometer in our lab. Um, so just like this one. Um, and I did a series of measurements with different um, HPMC, C12, nanoparticle, PNP hydrogels. And we, again, kind of reinforced what Hector saw that really the polymer content is what dictates this high shear response. You can see them all plotted on the same, same graph over here where 0 0.5, 1, um, the lowest, 1, 1, and then kind of all of the twos with the amount of polymer coming first all really overlap here. Um, and so this really showed us in our applications reducing the amount of polymer may make our material more injectable. So now in my presentation, I'm going to kind of segue um, to a few different applications where we took advantage of our measurements of viscosity um, to design a highly injectable material um, towards an exciting and an impactful application. So one of the, the key focuses of my PhD was delivering uh, CAR T cells in our PNP hydrogels to um, go after and attack solid tumors. Um, and so we co-formulated the CAR T cells with cytokines in our HPMC and PEG-PLA to form this, this CAR T cell loaded PNP hydrogel. And we injected these hydrogels um, next to solid tumors and saw if kind of delivering them locally in this way in this hydrogel niche um, could improve um, tumor treatment. We worked with the McCall lab at Stanford in particular to make the, the CAR T cells. Um, and so here in this project, I was loading, um, it was about 20 million cells um per mil in this hydrogel material um and you can see we made them in the kind of traditional mixing way i ran rheology with the cell laden on the cell laden hydrogels and even when we were encapsulating these high high numbers of cells um we actually see that we could measure the viscosity um using our viscometer and the viscosity barely changed um from what we see without cells, um, really insignificant differences. Um, and so we were pretty fascinated that even loading huge um, volume fractions of cells into our hydrogel barely changes kind of the injectability of our formulation. And we also looked at the yield stress, um, kind of looking where this viscosity falls um, with a, a flow ramp um, increasing that stress. And so we formulated CAR T cells and stimulatory cytokines in our gel material. And the reason we introduced these, cell, these cytokines are really to stimulate these CAR T cells to grow. Cytokines really help CAR T cells proliferate. And we wanted our gel to act as a proliferative niche when we were delivering these CAR T cells. And so one thing we found is when, when we encapsulate these cytokines, we really wanted to understand the diffusivity. How quickly does the cytokine leave the hydrogel? And so we used a technique called fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching, or FRAP, um, to understand the diffusivity. And so in FRAP, you have a fluorescently labeled molecule. Here are cytokines. You bleach it 
in a spot and you watch the other molecules kind of diffuse in and you can use this recovery curve to back out a diffusivity. And so IL-15, it's around 15 kilodaltons. And so we really expected it to diffuse um, somewhere in between a four kilodalton dextran and somewhere in between, somewhere near, and somewhere in between a 40 kilodalton dextran. But from our frac measurements, you can see the IL-15 was much lower than we expected. And I even did more experiments with IL-15 in different formulations, and they were all much lower um, than we expected. And so whenever the IL-15 was encapsulated in our polymer solution, even just a plain polymer solution, it was incredibly low. And so this led us to believe that IL-15 must be sticking um, to this PNP hydrogel matrix in some way. Um, and so we see much slower diffusion than you might expect. Um, and this is really positive for our application because we want the cytokine to stay around as long as possible. We don't want it to diffuse out of the gel. And so I confirmed this by doing a release experiment. So encapsulating the IL-15 in the gel, putting buffer above it, and watching the IL-15 release into this buffer and measuring how much released. And barely any actually released um, in the, the course of a week where I was sampling this buffer over time. And so this really confirmed our, our FRAP results. And we additionally confirmed um, these behaviors in vivo, um, where we administered IL-15 intravenously, we administered the cytokine subcutaneously, and then encapsulated in our gel. And you can see that it was cleared um, very quickly in both the IV and the subcutaneous um, in mice. This is measuring their blood over time. And whereas the concentration of IL-15 was much more steady over time in the PNP hydrogel, and you can measure this through the area under curve, the total exposure of the cytokine we were able to measure in the blood of the animal. And so we were also able to perform some preliminary preclinical experiments where we injected our treatment next to a um, tumor, and we we're easily to able to easily inject our, our, our 2 million CAR T cells next to our tumor and then image the tumor and the T cells separately over time. And so this was a medulloblastoma model in NSG mice. And so here's the imaging of the tumors over time. And you can see our traditional groups. Um, really, the, the tumors did not change much from infusing these CAR T cells. Whereas in the group with our hydrogel and our stimulatory cytokine um, that was easily injected in these mice, you can see we were able to clear these tumors in 12 days. Um, and you can see the quantification over here to the right. So really many more mice were cured with this, this gel treatment compared to our traditional treatments of just injecting the cells or infusing the cells intravenously. We also looked at the um, T cell response. And so you can see here our T cells are luminescent. So um, you can see in our traditional groups, we don't see very much T cell. Um, T cell response, really not much growth there. Um, whereas in our hydrogel with our cytokine, um, we saw a huge increase um, in T cell signal. You can see that quantified over here to the right. Um, so our treatment was really allowing these CAR T cells to expand and go and fight this tumor um, to deplete um, the cancer in the mice and really expand this, this army of T cells. So you can see the total flux at two weeks um, was much, much higher um, in, our, in our hydrogel group with IL-15, which we thought was pretty exciting. I'm gonna highlight um, one other project I worked on in our PhD, in my PhD, um, where we kind of took a spin on the PNP hydrogel with these HPMC polymers and nanoparticles. Here, instead of nanoparticles, those core shell nanoparticles, we use liposomes. And we mix these with 
our um, HPMC C12 again, our polymer with those hydrophobic C12 groups. And when we mix these two materials, we saw the formation of a robust gel once again. And the reason we chose to use liposomes is because they're highly modular. Um, you can just order liposomes. You don't have to do the polymerization like we were doing um, with the core shell nanoparticles. And because they're so modular, we could simply order plain zoiter ionic lipids. We could order lipids with a anionic negative charge, or we could even order lipids with an NTA nickel group. And we could use these different functionalities, these different lipids, to interact with our cargo, our drug of interest. So if we have a positively charged drug with these negatively charged lipids, we, we may slow down diffusion um, towards controlled release. So we first characterized these gels um, through our set of mechanical measurements. So we looked at the frequency sweep. We looked at how these gels are injectable. And indeed, they are comparably injectable based off of these viscometer measurements on our MD rock. Um, you can see they are actually a very, very low viscosity at these high shear rates. And they have that power law behavior like, like we're looking for. And they're quickly self-healing. So we can shear them and watch them return to their original viscosity in a few seconds. And so here's a liposome gel uh, being injected. And so then I highlighted that um, we were really interested in this modular controlled release of these different proteins and drugs um, with this hydrogel. And so here's just some proof of concept data um, that we used GFP to look at um, a cationic release compared to a histag interaction phase release versus our control, just no interaction. And indeed, we can see that um, the, the plane control releases the fastest, and we can get that, that um, area under the curve compared to when we have a charge interaction, it releases slower significantly. And then when we have this histag interaction, we looked at an NTA nickel and an NTA cobalt. So if you aren't familiar with these NTA interactions, they're commonly used in um, chromatography. Um, where you have an NTA group and then a molecule with his tag to help separate it. So we used an NTA nickel and an NTA cobalt, and you can see these both released incredibly slowly. Only a little over 20% um, was released in four weeks. Um, so we were really able to leverage this modular platform where you could just order these liposomes off the shelf to create this injectable hydrogel platform for controlled drug release. And finally, the last application um, that I will go over today um, is pretty, pretty different. Um, and I thought that I'd throw this in here because it's very relevant to this forum. Um, the last application I'll emphasize are excipients that our lab has developed. Um, this is work done by John Fleek. It's on BioArchive. Um, it's in the, the publication process right now. Um, but Basically, our lab has derived these different excipients, um, and these are copolymers. Um, and we, the excipient of interest in this paper is Moni. It's an acrylomorphine anisoacrylamide polymer. Um, it's a mouthful, so that's why we call it Moni. And our lab is really interested in developing better stable formulations um, for antibody solutions towards subcutaneous injections because they're much easier in this process like many of you you might know and we found that in insulin formulations these excipients really might help um, stability they coat the surface of a solution and stop these proteins from aggregating at the surface and from crashing out um, and losing efficacy and so we hypothesized that using these copolymer excipients may work with antibody solutions as well. The antibody that our lab focused on is this PGT-121 uh, antibody. It's an anti-HIV antibody. Um, and I would direct you for the paper, to the paper for more information about the antibody itself. We got it from a collaborator. 
Um, but what we found is when we have these antibodies in solution um, and we have our moni in solution, we see a drop in the surface tension. Um, this was measured on a Langmuir trough. Um, and we also see a drop in the, the complex viscosity, so more of that oscillatory viscosity um, measured on the Langmuir trough as well. Um, and we used our MVROC um, to look at the, the, the shear um, viscosity, a, a bunch of shear rates. And we, we find that um, indeed the, the, the shear viscosity actually looks very similar. So it may not actually help injectability, but it does seem to greatly help stability. Um, and so here we did an accelerated aging study where we had our antibody um, and we had our moni or just the plain antibody. Um, and this was a FRET-based um, assay, I believe. And basically we can measure the amount of intact antibody as the signal goes down and it's it's shaking um, and it's at 50, 50 degrees. So we, we are accelerating this instability, but we see that the PGT-121 quickly um, is unstable in about a week. Whereas when we have this moni present, we see um, much longer um, persistence, much more stability. And you can see we looked at this at a few different concentrations, 55, um, 120. And so Moni greatly improves the stability of these antibody solutions. Yeah, so I hope today I've, I've taught you a little bit about what our lab does working on these physical hydrogels and these different polymer solutions to improve um, drug formulations and help control, um, control delivery of important therapeutics. Um, and I highlighted a few key applications that our lab works on, ranging from um, delivering cells. So I talked about a cell therapy. Um, I talked about our liposome gels towards very controlled release of different proteins. And then finally, the last application I just noted were these excipients towards stabilized antibody solutions. Um, so I'd like to thank my whole lab. Um, so here's my advisor, Eric Apple at Stanford um, and our lab group at our ski retreats um, and hiking. Um, I'm happy to connect always. Um, my, here's my email. Um, I'm on Twitter. Um, so feel free to reach out. Um, but I'd love to hear your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Grosskopf. And I will give everyone just a minute to drop some questions in that chat panel, and then we can start our Q&A session. All right, I'll get started with some questions. Someone's asked, is the crossover of G prime and G double prime an indication of gel formation? Yeah, so basically, um, if you see a crossover, um, it means that your material is going from a liquid-like state to a solid-like state um, in that frequency sweep. So if you want your material to be um, solid-like across all the, the time scales that you're able to measure on a rheometer, you want to see no crossover. You'd prefer to see G prime always higher than that G double prime. But if you do see a crossover, um, it likely means that there's this transition that your material behaves more like a liquid um, at those lower frequencies. Wonderful. And someone's wondering if the differing P and P ratio changed the LVER, um, they're saying percent strain or stress input for the hydrogel frequency sweep. Yeah, so I measured the frequency sweeps. I always measure those within the linear viscoelastic regime. So I measure those at a very low strain. Um, but the the um, strain that the material yields in an amplitude sweep does change. Um, it's always higher than that one weight percent or one percent 
strain that I was measuring in the frequency sweep, but it does change. And we actually see that <coughs> in that um, regime where we saw that synergy of the polymer to nanoparticle ratio, we actually see higher um, strains that the material yields. So it has a longer um, linear viscoelastic regime when we're able to form this more robust material. And uh, was the same percent input used or amplitude sweep performed for each PNP material? Yeah, so we performed, I, would, I might need to check, but I performed amplitude sweeps, I believe at one hertz um, for all of these. Wonderful. And is there a concern of aggregation of the nanoparticles? And if so, what would be the impact? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we we are concerned. We're doing studies right now looking at um, basically how stable these formulations of the nanoparticles are. Um, but we perform DLS, dynamic light scattering of our nanoparticles to make sure um, it's pretty monodispersed. Um, not no aggregates in our formulation um, before we make a gel. Um, but definitely we're working to scale up these gels um, as we move towards bigger and bigger applications. Um, and so we really want to understand how to have the most stable solutions. Right now, once in a while, we do see some nanoparticles kind of crashing out or forming aggregates, and so we filter them. Um, but we do want to understand kind of what will keep a really nice, um, clean, not aggregated nanoparticle solution. Um, but for all these studies, I made them at a pretty small scale. Um, it was for research. So I was able to make sure the nanoparticles were really monodispersed. <laughs> and uh, can intrinsic viscosity be used to probe interaction? Um, I think I would say yes. Um, I think you can clearly learn things and we learn things through running these viscosity um, measurements and I think today even the the talk before mine highlighted that yeah you can really understand things at the molecular level just through viscosity measurements um, but I would definitely recommend having other types of measurements in addition to just a viscosity measurement to really back up what you're seeing. Do the higher assay shear rates disrupt the CART cell membrane integrity? Yeah, so that's something we're interested in as well. Um, we've, we have actually published some papers um, early in my PhD. I helped with some papers basically showing that our hydrogels can act as sort of a protection um, for these cells at very high shear rates. And we found that cell viability is is measurably increased after injection <coughs> when they are encapsulated in a hydrogel. But I would like to, um, I think it's a really interesting research question. We could try encapsulating really high numbers of cells and go as high as we can possibly go on our viscometer and see kind of what threshold or shear rate um, we can hit before we see a huge drop in our cell viability. But so far in our applications we're interested in, like that CAR T cell project, um, I measured viability after injection and we always saw um, decently high above 90% viability. So we didn't worry too much um, that we were disturbing cell membranes. Wonderful. And I'm going to give everyone who's with us right now another minute to drop any additional questions they may have in that chat pane. Yeah, and thank you all for being patient with me when I, I had trouble uh, getting this to work. Um, so I really appreciate your patience. It looks like there are no new questions coming in. So I just want to thank you again, Dr.
Dr. Grosskopf for taking the time to share all of your research with us. Thank you for taking the time to answer everyone's questions. This was a wonderful, really in-depth, thorough presentation. And uh, I think everyone here with us today learned a lot. So I just wanna thank you again. Yeah, thank you so much. Feel free to reach out if you're interested or have more questions or follow me on Twitter and we can connect. <laughs>